Welcome back. Thanks for staying on board. Uh, one of those uh, kind of seminal moments. Where were you? Where were you when it happened? Remember the date? I do. It was uh, September 9th, 2010, when the big uh, explosion took place down in San Bruno, California. I remember exactly where I was. I actually was lecturing a group of law enforcement executives, and one of the uh, the students in the group was a police chief from San Bruno. And uh, we started talking. She's getting noticed uh, on the breaks, and uh, we're kind of getting updated on it. And the, the incredible destruction uh, and loss of life that came from that event. And now you see that uh, PG&E has been slapped with a record-setting $1.6 billion, with a B, $1.6 billion fine. That's huge. And uh, we have the honor of having in studio the attorney who's representing has represented the civil injured parties on this uh, in the uh, wrongful death and personal injury cases. And is also involved in continuing litigation, but we'll talk about that uh, a little bit uh, in the context of what what this may mean about that in, in terms of this fine uh, with regard to where you are now on this derivative action uh, with the shareholders of PG&E. Uh, Steve Campora from Dreyer, Babich, Bucola, Wood, and Campora. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thanks very much for being here, Counselor. Thanks for having me, John. T- tell us, just kind of bring us up to date. What, what uh, first of all, in the context of all of this, I have, I have no doubt that... Uh, that uh, you have done right by your clients uh, in the initial uh, personal injury and wrongful death cases. But as you see this happen uh, with the with the fine, what does that signal in your mind in terms of um, wh- how, how big a deal is this? What does it say about what I know you already know about uh, how this played out? It, it is a huge fine. It's the biggest fine that's ever been levied in California. But it's not as big as a fine as it could have been. The city of San Bruno wanted more, wanted a $3 billion dollar fine, uh, up to $4 billion. And the report itself indicates that this doesn't include all the day's violations that uh, they could have assessed against PG&E. And, of course, there's also been some, I want to call it, uh, conflict of interest discussion between the Public Utilities Commission and PG&E with various executives exchanging emails and other information that's still under investigation. Now, in this, that's interesting, uh, in this derivative action where you're representing the shareholders, tell us about the shareholders. Who, who are the shareholders of PG&E versus uh, the board and the, uh, the, the uh, what's the, uh, the... People who own stock in the company uh, are the shareholders. Um, essentially, the allegation is that the company wouldn't take action against the board members, so the shareholders are doing it. Um, the shareholders are going to be responsible for, as I understand it, from what came out yesterday, $850 million of this fine which will be shareholder money, meaning the money they would have gotten from their stock, which they're not, now not going to get. So there, there's a fiduciary component to this in terms of the responsibility of PG&E to, to manage their – obviously, it, it pales in comparison to the loss of life and destruction of property and injury, but the, the responsibility, fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to make sure that the operation is maintained and safeguards are in place – uh, and that uh, appears to have been lost. Well, the problem with all this, John, from my perspective, is that there's not one person that I'm aware of who has been held accountable for anything that they did that caused these deaths, that caused these homes to be destroyed, that blew up this neighborhood. No person has been terminated. No person has suffered any adverse job action. In fact, uh, if you look at the president of PG&E's compensation, he got a raise from 2010 to 2011. His stock went up from 2010 to 2011, 76% increase, over $3 million. How does that happen? You know, that you, we we probably all know somebody who works for PG&E. I have a good friend, a friend that works for PG&E, holder in highest regard, good person. And, uh, and, and I know many who work in various uh, capacities at PG&E. And do a good job and take their obligations seriously. Where does the responsibility lie in the organization for uh, these decisions having been made, or the failure to take care of business and ensure the greatest degree of safety that the that the ratepayers and uh, and residents of the jurisdiction, the areas where this took place, uh, could be protected, have their needs met? Well, one of the one of the findings that's really critical that the board came out with is that essentially PG&E created a culture where they put and they valued cost savings and money over safety. And that's not a decision that's made by the people who are in the field. I mean, yeah. PG&E knows they have an aging pipeline, yet they've reduced maintenance workers. Before this happened, they had reduced maintenance workers by 25 or 28 percent. They have pipelines that were put in the ground in 1956, and instead of having more maintenance, 
They're having less maintenance. How, who does that? So 58-year-old, 59-year-old, well, at the time, I guess 56-year-old uh, uh, pipelines that had not been checked out. And, and, and ha, to what degree has that uh, maintenance been addressed in the intervening years? Since the explosion? Yeah. There has been an increase in their hydrostatic testing, um, but there have been incidents since the explosion which indicate that PG&E still didn't know what they had in the ground in several places. At the time this pipeline blew up, PG&E didn't have any as-built drawings, had no record showing the pipeline had ever been tested, had no idea how the pipeline was constructed, had no information about this pipeline at all. It had been in the ground since 1956, and they knew nothing about it. And they're the ones who put it in the ground. 1956, that's about the time, uh, I guess, a big chunk of the peninsula out that way, San Bruno Way, was developed. Uh, but there's other parts of the state that uh, obviously predate that. So what's, what's the status of, of uh, maintenance throughout the state of California, especially the, old, uh, the oldest communities in the state? Well, the, they're supposed to be doing it by what they call high-consequence areas, so based on population, because in places like the Bay Area, these pipelines have gone through areas of large population. I mean, you can go online and find out and look and see where gas transmission lines are in relation to your house. But theoretically, they're going through and doing the, the upgrades and the testing in the high-consequence areas first. Well, I, I guess that makes sense, but it seems to me that there's a, an age component, too, and in the, in the inevitable, uh, the, I think, reliable factor that uh, or consideration that time and use and pressure and other factors will age the infrastructure and therefore, there's an element of predictability. And when you have that level of predictability and the the opportunity to th through a, a company that uh, that brings in enormous amounts of revenue through a, to address those ongoing maintenance needs and eliminate the or at least minimize the risk, why not? What's where, where did it fall the, apart? And the report says, and, I, and the evidence I've seen says that they they would get approval and have money budgeted for safety, and that money would be, then be diverted to other things, including employees or benefits and, and bonuses for executive officers of PG&E. Very, very, very interesting dynamic. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the neighbors. Think about the neighborhoods in which you live and what level of safety and security, or maybe even neighborhoods you visit. You don't have to be a, a resident of San Bruno to be there on that day. All that uh, can, coming up on KFBK. Don't go away. Welcome back. Thanks for staying on board. John McGinnis with you. Uh, and we're talking to, uh, to the council who represented the, uh, the families who, who unfortunately lost loved ones and people who sustained uh, personal injuries in the PG&E explosion in San Bruno. Uh, and he continues, uh, Steve Campora continues to represent the shareholders of PG&E in litigation against them. And just to kind of put things in context, PG&E has just been fined, a new precedent-setting fine, $1.6 billion dollars. And uh, just a, just a couple of thoughts, uh, Steve. What what, um, what what message do you have? If you could talk to the, the leadership at uh, PG&E, and it occurs to me uh, th this is an operation that's throughout the state, obviously, and uh, so nobody's nobody's um, exempt from the potential consequences if you live, work, and travel in the state of California, and you have deficiency in terms of maintaining volatile lines. That, that obviously, by, by, by no guess, by no estimation, but real-life experience, it can have an extraordinary adverse impact on life and property. W what message do you have to people who run that, uh, that organization? Well, the message I have for them now is that they can't cut back on safety, and the most important thing has to be the safety of the people who live along that pipeline. They clearly, what they did was put profits over safety. That's what this board did. That's what these officers did. And the, it just is infuriating to me that not one person from PG&E has been held accountable for that. Eight people are dead, homes are destroyed, yet not one person has been held accountable. Now, there's still a criminal action pending in the Bay Area. There's an action pending in federal court in the San Francisco area against the corporation itself. And again, there would be a fine. But no person... And then until people get held responsible for these things, it's just money. They, they're not responsible. They don't pay that money. The corporation pays the money. So until some person is held responsible for these kinds of things, 
I think they'll continue to happen. And, and what level of uh, training requirement or expectations are in play for people who make critical decisions regarding the updating, updated and, and continuing maintenance of this system? I, I, in your occupation, uh, MCLA continuing uh, professional training is necessary. I, I, you went to law school and did great, and since that time, uh, you've had a great practice, done a, a wonderful job. But I want to know that you're staying on top of issues in the law if I'm going to ask you and pay you to represent me, right? And, and airline pilots have to have continuing uh, recurrent training. Uh, people who do radio shows have to study the FCC guidelines and know what the requirements are. Law enforcement has to have recurrent uh, training. Uh, medical, everybody. But what about these folks? What's their status? What's the standard? I asked those questions when we did depositions. And by the way, it wasn't just me. It was a man named Frank Petrie, who was also a lawyer in San Francisco, and, of course, Bob Bucola from my office. It wasn't just me, but we did right. 50 or 60 depositions. One of the things I asked the engineers is, do you have continuing education? And I learned that the, one of the principal engineers at PG&E, who was in charge of their risk management program, had failed the professional licensing examination for an engineer in the state of California three times. Did he ultimately pass it, I assume? No. He never passed it? Not to my knowledge. Not at the time I took his deposition. So, it, again, the element of predictability... With regard to bad outcomes to, to the operation and maintenance of volatile pipelines by somebody who lacked the core critical standards necessary to, to execute the duties of that office. He it, it couldn't like, pass the test. It, it, you know, we, we've talked on this program quite a lot about the VA and the, the failure to have accountability there. And I just wonder, uh, it, it sounds very reminiscent of that. And there, to, to my mind, John, so far there has been no real accountability. So what, what advice would you have for people who live in, uh, in older neighborhoods that have uh, a lot of traffic and a lot of, uh, a lot of use of the lines? Uh, is, is, you mentioned there's a way to check online. to. Uh... You can look online to see where your house is in relation to any gas transmission line. You can find out where that line is, where it runs, when it was installed. Um, but people also need to understand that there are gas distribution lines throughout their neighborhoods. And if they smell gas... They need to report it immediately. But one of the things people don't understand is the odor that natural gas has is an addition to the gas. So, for example, I had a case some years ago here in, Cal in Rancho Cordova yeah. where the leak occurred, but then the gas followed the sewer line into the house and it ran through the sand, and that sand takes the smell out. So when the gas got in the house, you couldn't smell it. Yeah. There was no more smell. So it's an, it's an insidious and it's a very dangerous product. And that's why PG&E has to use the utmost care because this product that they're selling will kill people that was if another, they don't handle it right. That was another fatality in Rancho Cordova around Christmas time. And, exactly uh, right. And I know it's interesting. I know you have really immersed yourself in the knowledge of all these systems and how they work and how underground pipe systems work. And, I mean, you're, you, uh, I know it's a whole new field, uh, a whole new area of expertise for you. And uh, I have a feeling this is probably not the last – litigation you'll be doing with this uh, area. I hope it is. Yeah. But, you know, in 2004, the federal government essentially told PG&E and every other utility, you will consider cyclic fatigue in evaluating your pipes, and you will assume that there's a defect in your line when you do that. And PG&E did not do it, not from the day in 2004 when it was passed until the day that line blew up, six years. Interesting. And that line blew up and killed people. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Maybe you uh, maybe you live and own property in a newer area that's got no such uh, fatigue issues. But if you visit other areas, if you have family in other areas, if you have uh, occasion to travel through other areas, I think everybody's uh, everybody's potentially in harm's way. Counselor, uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know this audience is very, very interested in this, and I appreciate you making yourself available. And uh, all the best to you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Have a great weekend. As you can tell by the sound of music, that's it for me. But stick around because the lovely Kitty O'Neill is coming up next with the afternoon news. I'll be back with you on Monday. Have a glorious.